Drogba indirilecek ana Snyder Snyder gol Merhaba and welcome to episode 74 of the Lion's Den, a Galside podcast done by the community for the community. My name is Yasin. Uh, it's not the usual crew we got going on today, as well as your host. Usually you hear Emre here or Summit here. The reason for that is because I'm here with John from Canada and we're doing a somewhat of a live commentary after a horrific result and honestly, game plan from our very own golf side against Copenhagen. At the time you're listening to this, it's already known, you know, we lost to Copenhagen. And John and I just have way too many things to talk about today. Uh, way too many feelings. We thought about doing a podcast on the weekend, as we usually do. But, you know, it's just, there's a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about the, the Copenhagen game on the weekend as well with the rest of the crew. But we thought we'd get some live thoughts in today as well. So with that said, John, how are you doing, my man? Well, it's a very sad day, man. Very, very sad day. I I can't believe it, man. I can't believe it. The episode we put out the other day, I just couldn't, no matter what I did, I just couldn't imagine a scenario where we bottle this. And here we are, man. So tragic. Tragic is an understatement, John. I mean, we, it feels like just earlier today, we were, I mean, it's been a couple of days now, but giving the predictions, talking about how this game is going to go about everything that's on the line, whether that's the money, you know, the 10 plus million that Galsai would have put in their bank account if we won this game and advanced to the next round, or it was simply the, the fame, the, the prestige how the rest of the world was going to talk about Galsai making out of the Champions League group stage consisting of Bayern Munich and Manchester United. But, you know, we kind of just fumbled that uh, miserably. Um, there's a lot that I think went wrong today. Uh, it's easy to point fingers to individuals, whether that's a player, a coach. It's easy to create excuses. Um, away game, you know, uh, how good Copenhagen is, you know, in their home pitch and their results at home, how things were against us. But um, I think we can narrow it down to a few things. We'll talk about everything that's on our mind, but uh, how should we get started with this? Is, is it the lineup? Uh, is it, you know, anything preliminary to the game even starting? How, how do you, I'll, I'll leave this to you. I'll toss it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get into the uh, lineup and some stats as well, and then we can dive into it. And before I do that, I think that we really have to applaud this fan base and really pat ourselves on the back. I mean, the buildup to this match, like, the community making like crazy videos, edits, you know, pictures, uh, it, like the amount of content that comes out before these Champions League matches, it's absolutely outstanding. And, you know, you can really tell how much this means to all of us. And it's a shame we couldn't get it done. But I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, because it's always amazing. We know when we're at home, how the fans are and, you know, the choreography we make and things like that. So. I just wanted to point that out, you know, for the greatest fan base in the world. Yeah, I just quickly want to add on to that. That's a good point. Um, shout out to one of our own, actually, Summit. This guy is a fanatic beyond you can imagine. He, this guy flew to Copenhagen and going there, buying his ticket, landing in Copenhagen, he had no idea whether he was going to be able to attend the game or not. He... He went there on the limb of saying, I can hopefully find myself a ticket to, to attend the match, along with several other Galside fans. He's not alone in this, but, you know, they, there's so many fans that went to Copenhagen without the slightest idea of whether they're going to be able to attend or not, just to support the team, 
just for the vibes, just to get together and do what they love doing best, and that's supporting the team. So huge shout out to all the fans. I know that there's a lot listening that also did that. So shout out to you guys in Summit. That that's very commendable. Absolutely. So with that said, then we will get into the match. I'll get into the starting eleven um first, like I normally do. So this was round six in group A, final match of the group stage away to Copenhagen. Our starting eleven was Muslera in goal, Angelino, Abdul Kerim, um, Davidson Sanchez, Sasha Boy, Khan Ihan, Torreira, Zaha, Kerem Akturkolo playing in the number 10 role. Tete and Icardi up front. We'll go through some stats. We finished this one with 63% possession. Expected goals and XG according to Fought Mob of 1.92. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but uh, 22 total shots, seven on target, which seems kind of odd, but Sofa Score and Fought Mob say the same thing seven on target. I guess those came towards the end of the match. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, with that said, um, and like we mentioned, this was a 1-0 result. The only uh, match in this group stage where we couldn't score a goal. Where should we start, man? Maybe we can start with the lineup that Okan went with today. Um, you know, there's, I guess, a little bit of controversy surrounding the whole thing. You know, Tete was a bit of a surprise. We have Kerem playing in the number 10, which, you know, a lot of people... S- are you know in agreement that that is not something that has worked for us this season so far um so yeah what do you what do you think about that what do you think about the 11 you know i i took a look at our last few lineups you know in i guess relatively successful games adana at home pendic at away manchester united alanya and we have never really established a lineup that works consistently you know um and maybe works is not the right word but just consistency you know from that perspective we don't have a lineup you know we have Kedem at number 10 sometimes we have martins at the 10 sometimes we have tete that started on the wing last game prior games it was zaha sometimes it's Ziyech, sometimes barisha per Yilmaz. there's just been a lot of inconsistency and, and as a fan that is an opportunity for you to really observe each one and make your own conclusions okay this guy works this guy doesn't when this guy plays with that one it works really well on that side when he doesn't play with him it's a mess and the conclusion that i've come to personally you know uh your average fan not an analyst nothing you know i don't have credentials or anything like that as an average fan i've come to come to the conclusion a long time ago that kedam is not a number 10 and we've talked about this week in week out on every single podcast when he plays we talk about it when he doesn't play number 10 we talk about it we talk about why it's a good idea and why it's not a good idea today okan buruk started with kerem at number 10 and in my honest opinion i thought it's what cost us the game and look there's a lot of things that went wrong today um i'm not here to say that the remaining 10 players on the pitch played great I'm not here to say that if Kerem was off the pitch completely, it would have been better. Just the pure idea and fact that Kerem was number 10 on the pitch today to start the game and finish it was the main problem. And I'm even more shocked that Okan Hoja stayed that way in the second half after the terrible first half that we saw. Um, Man, I... That's that's the real main thing that's on my mind. I'm sure there's other areas of the starting eleven that we can criticize, like the left back position, you know, the the wings, the midfield. But Kedem at number ten, John. I know you probably feel the same. What do you think about it? I mean, I, I'm just it, it. This does my head in, man. It really does. This absolutely does my head in. It it has never worked. Like we. He has never looked good in this position. I just don't understand. Like, you know, he puts a couple bad uh, performances in in this position. Mertens comes in, plays phenomenal. Two goals, assists. The team is flowing. The team is meshing. And then we just go right back to it. And 
I don't understand why. Why is Okan forcing this? Like, it's clear you're just playing Kerem there because you want to include him in the squad, not because you think he's effective in this position. You're just playing him just so he can be part of the team. And it, it just, it absolutely does my head in. And like, it, it just goes back to a point I made a few episodes ago. And someone was just disagreeing with me. I can't remember. Um, we put four past Alanya. And I, and I was trying to say that's not a coincidence. Yeah, okay, fine. The argument is Alanya's dog shit. But so was Istanbul Sport and all the other teams where we only scored one goal. And those were all games that where Kerem was playing in this role. So there's just so, it, there's overwhelming evidence to support this claim. He's not good in this position. He's just not. And he makes, he, the rest of the team has a shit performance because of that. Yeah. So I, I just don't understand the logic behind this. And every time, I also notice every time I criticize Kerem, I get attacked for it. Always, <laughs> always, always, always. But what do you want me to say? I just don't know what there is to say, though. You can blame anything you want. He's not good in that position. He just isn't good there. Like, that's it. And the amount of chances that he squandered in this group stage campaign was enough to put us through to the next round. And it's as simple as that. Like, I don't know what else to say about that. So we find ourselves going in this circle where, you know, we're going back to the main point that I made. Why did we get all these players then? Right? Why did we do this? Kerem is a good left winger. So why did we get Zaha? Right? Mm -hmm. We needed a number 10. We have Mertens. Why did we buy Ziyech if he's never going to play there and he's going to play on the right wing? Right? Mm -hmm. It just brings us yeah. back to the top again with these same arguments. So I have to agree with you in saying that that was probably our main flaw today. You know, it, it, you, it, there's just such a difference from when Mertens is starting the match. So I have no choice but to put this match heavily on Okan. Yeah. You know, I have to. Tete, a horrible decision in my opinion. Horrible. You know, we were all begging in like the 30th minute for Mertens and Ziyech to come in. And we wasted, I think, almost 60 minutes with Kerem and Tete. Yeah. You know? So I have I have no choice really but to put this so heavily on Okan. And it's just so disappointing, man. I agree. Um I <clears throat> Okan Buruk really fumbled the bag here today and unfortunately has really dented my trust in him as well. I mean, for a year and a half now, um, we've been praising Okan Buruk because he deserves the praise. He has done wonders for this team. It is not easy to manage this many great players at the same time, uh, to handle all the egos, to win as many games as he did. His win-loss ratio or his point ratio is incredible. Props to him. But if it's been a year and a half and your greatest weakness is that every single fan who follows this club closely knows is that your substitution timing is consistently bad then like mm -hmm. oh jump like that that's costing us games you yeah. you mentioned you mentioned tete starting i i saw the lineup and i said i kind of understand some things right we we talked about on Helinho playing at the left back position he ended up being pretty costly but you understand why he played right uh Kedem, we just talked about terrible decision. Tete, he hasn't been playing consistently. You know, he played a pretty good game last game. We talked about it against Adana Demispor. He did a lot of good things, but his finishing was off. So you might say to yourself, okay, he kind of deserved it. He played a good game last game, except for the finishing. So you hope that he plays similar quality, but he finishes the chances he gets today. Okay, no comment for that, Hojum. Um... And then on the opposite side, Zaha, there's really little left to criticize. Okay, that's our 11. Game starts. Now, everything that happens after minute one, now that you made your selection, is your responsibility to analyze a game live because that's why you get paid the big bucks. That's why you have the job and we don't. Mm -hmm. To analyze a game, who's playing like what? Who's clearly off their game? Who's not working with the rest of the team? Who's holding the team back? And I thought, for the most part, like, you know, we're in a pretty big chat of Galsai fans, several of them. 
And the, the main consensus that everybody agreed on was Tete was terrible. Angelino looked terrible. And Kerem at number 10 was not working. You were in this game with a result of nothing but a win doing us good here. We needed a win. And to win, you need to score goals. And to score goals, your offense, your forward, your attackers, your wingers, they need to be working. You need to say to yourself, okay, if this game goes on for another 60 minutes, 40 minutes, 20 minutes, I trust what we have on the pitch right now is going to get us the goal that we need to, to win the game. After 45 minutes, I was not convinced whatsoever, John. I was like, okay, this is not working. Tete and Sasha Bowie on the right wing. Both great athletes. They both have their strengths, but they both severely lack the ability to create chances. They don't have that creativity. They don't have that IQ, offensively speaking, to make something out of nothing. We've seen it work before, but that's when they had Martins, who is a high IQ player, experienced player, who knows how to make triangles work. You add a player like uh, Mertens into any triangle, it will be functional because he has an IQ for that. We talk about triangles all the time in football. You know, No matter what formation you have, a good triangle is needed to make plays happen. Throw Mertens in there, it happens. But when you have Tete, Sasha Bowie, and then you add a guy like Kerem in there, then you're really on the fence of okay is this a functional offense yeah and to me the answer is no yeah so Kedem, he made everybody look bad today in my opinion and that again is as a result of okan hoja starting it that way and not making the necessary changes yeah um i i like i would have to agree in terms of you know my trust in okan being shaken a little bit and look I mean, the reason why I say that, I respect everything he's done with us so far, but where he loses a lot of points to me is, look, you're with these players every single day. Every single day you're with these players. The days that you're not with these players, you're, you know, analyzing our team, analyzing performances, how we can improve, what we can do better. Nobody, there's no man on the face of the earth 8 billion people, there's not any other man that knows the team like Okan Buruk. So how is it possible then, after 45 minutes, you can look at that performance in the first half and not make changes at halftime in a match where you need to score. You have 45 minutes left to score and win the game. 40, everything boils down to these 45 minutes and you still continue. And then of course, as... It was every other game. It was too late when the subs came on. Yeah. It was too late. So he loses so many points with me there because I just don't see how that can possibly happen. I, I, I, just, I just don't see it. You know, it's not like we have a new manager who's just come in. He's still trying to figure things out. No, you know the team. You know the players better than anyone. So if you can't see what's going on on the field and adjust accordingly in a game like this, where like I said... You have 45 minutes now to score and win this game with like 12 million euros on the line. Like, I, I, I just, I'm not sure. I, I really don't know what to say about that. It's hugely disappointing. Um, and yeah, the, the, the sort of um, part of this as well is one thing I wanted to talk about was then Okan's game plan. Mm -hmm. So... One thing it was I was a game plan. It, that's the thing. That's exactly the thing. I don't know what it is we were trying to do here or what it is we were trying to accomplish. I mean, I don't really know if the game plan was to cross the ball as much as possible because um, we finished this game with 48 crosses. Copenhagen had 13. And we connected 11 of them, by the way. 23% of our crosses we connected. So what exactly were we trying to do here? Were we, is that how we were trying to break them down? By crossing 24-7 against their 7 feet tall center backs all the time? Uh, I, I just didn't see much of anything. There, was, there, there wasn't much of anything. You know, the front four there looked totally disconnected. Kerem running all over the place. Zaha trying to work with Angelino, who I'm going to get to later because 
I, I, I'm going to give a piece of my mind about that. <laughs> Tete, I, he's Brazilian, bro. Like, there's nothing else I can say, really. I think he lost the ball. I saw a stat earlier. I can't remember how many times he lost the ball. Like, I appreciate him trying to be creative, but nah, it, it didn't work. So all in all, I'm not sure what the game plan was today. And that's extremely disappointing, bro, considering what was at stake here, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of sad, actually, because throughout the first half, especially, you just see Tete and Sasha Bowie trying to make a two-man a, a two -man game work. And mm -hmm. it failed so many times. And actually... Due to its failure, we almost let up goals a couple times as well. Yeah. Tete gets the ball. Sasha Bowie makes a run around him, in front of him. Tete plays a terrible pass or loses it. And next thing you know, they're attacking us from our right side and getting into very easy chances to score goals. I mean, not once, not twice. I think this happened at least three times throughout the game with just those two alone. And then they don't know what to do. Kedem is too busy talking to Icardi about God knows what he's talking about. He's on his ass the whole time. Yeah. Uh, then you have Kanaihan and Lucas Torreira, two decent structural midfielders, but they they're not the guy that you can pass the ball to and you know play an incredible pass into the box or whatever it is. So you know when Sasha Bowie and Tete they get stuck, they pass it to Lucas Torreira. Lucas Torreira switches the ball to Kanaihan back and forth, back and forth. Tried to play it to Wilfred Zaha. He tries to make a dribble between three people because they were at least double teaming him the entire time. Like, it just, <laughs> there was no game plan to your point. It's just really sad to see. And, and that's when you really can criticize where is our creative number 10 to connect the pieces. Mm -hmm. That's why you need a creative number 10. A guy who has a good touch, who has a good feel for the game, who knows where everybody is at all times. Like, that was severely lacking. And Copenhagen is a very disciplined team. You, that's not a team that you can easily just hope that they make mistakes or leave gaps between their defense. That didn't happen. Is If that's what we thought was going to happen, keep dreaming. You know, I, I get it. Copenhagen is not a very well-skilled team. You, th you saw it throughout. They made mistakes in their midfield and in the, in the attack. They get chances that they butcher. It's simply because they just don't have the skill, right? They're, the quality of their players is not the same as ours, but they found those chances because they're structurally disciplined. They they put the pieces together properly. And man, the crosses, I, I don't even know what to say about that. Icardi has admittedly not been in form for some time now. His heading ability, scoring from headers, is even more, you know, a ghost, a shadow of itself of what it used to be. Yeah. So if, you're, if your game plan is to cross a ball to Icardi and hope he scores from a header, when I don't remember the last time he did that is, then we really need to reconsider how we go about these games and what we want to do. I think the closest chance that we got to scoring, one of two, was Ziyech scoring, uh, shooting from distance towards the end of the game. And what did we say on the last podcast about how we want to go about this game, mm -hmm. how we think we should go about this game? Shooting from distance because they're going to sit back likely yeah. or they're going to be structurally disciplined and we're going to need players like Ziyech and Zaha to do what they do and shoot from distance. Yeah. Because we we already know that we're not the most structurally cohesive unit in making passes. So that's what you count on. Okan Buruk didn't see that. He, did, he thought otherwise. And Ziyech came on the pitch and showed him, okay, look, I can make the crosses that you want. Nobody's finished in them. I can shoot from distance like I everybody knows I can. And I almost scored a fucking screamer as a result so <laughs> yeah <sighs> absolutely and the point about Icardi you know I find it interesting how every time someone has criticism for Kerem the number one comeback is well what about Icardi he <laughs> makes 400 million dollars a year and blah blah blah blah blah and yes <laughs> that's true but did we get him the ball today? Did we, get, did we get him in scoring positions whatsoever? What kind of service did we give our striker today to score goals? Right? The one, the one time he touched the ball in the box, he set Kerem up from the penalty spot and he sent it into a different orbit. Right? As per usual. So I'm not sure what kind of argument that is exactly. You know, where's the service? Like people... 
I, I, I just, I can't stand when people look at things in such a black and white way. You know, like you look at the score sheet. Oh, guess whose name isn't there? Acardi. That must mean that he's dog shit in bad form, right? And okay, fine. Maybe he's in bad form, but how is he going to score goals though? How? You know, how is he supposed to get involved? We're not getting him the ball. If we're getting him the ball and he just can't score, he's just squandering chances, you know, just messing up in front of the net. That's a different story. That's a lot bigger issues. He has a lot bigger issues then, right? Mm -hmm. But bro, like we bought a player like Mauro, Mauro Icardi and how is it possible we can't get him the ball? You know, like that should be our number one priority. He needs the ball. Get him the ball and he'll score. Right? Mm -hmm. But he was just totally uninvolved today. Like, I, I, I don't know. I'm I'm I'm not sure, man. It's it's um it's just so frustrating. It's just so so frustrating, man. And then you can see he's not getting the ball, he's not getting into chances, he starts dropping into the midfield a little bit to try to get himself more involved. And I, I don't know. It just, it didn't work today, man. We were just absolutely all over the place. And I, I just, I'm just finding it so hard to believe in a match like this, this is the performance we put in, man. I just, I never imagined this. It's so disappointing. Um, yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah. Um, no, I, I agree completely. I mean, there's several names. I mean, I don't want people thinking that this is just about Okamburo and Kerem. Obviously, the rest of the guys didn't play that well either. Mm -hmm. Already we talked about Zaha wasn't on his game. Mm -hmm. You can attribute that to maybe the space that he was given or wasn't given. Yeah. They, Copenhagen did their homework. They knew that Zaha is a guy who's very dangerous when he gets the ball with space. And they didn't give it to him. They double teamed him every single time. Um the connection with Anadino wasn't necessarily great either. Uh, that was unfortunate. Um, the, the midfield duo, Lucas Suarez and Kanaihan, as much as I like them together, I think they lack in the attacking component of their game. You know, you, you can't really look at either one of those players and say, okay, you know, when the other one sits back, the other one can really go forward and make dangerous passes or something like that. that that wasn't necessarily the case uh sasha bowie unfortunately i would say today was a little bit of an off game for him in the in the attack uh he was actually i think he's been improving in that area of his game uh today was just not necessarily it defensively sasha bowie did his job he he won the ball he made a couple of mistakes here and there but he was quick to resolve that issue you know win the ball back and uh give us another opportunity going forward but uh, overall the team just they, they didn't look right. And again, that falls to the coach, right? To mm -hmm. see that mm -hmm. and make the necessary changes mm -hmm. before it's too late. Um, I, all this boils down to the coach. Uh, there's no ifs, buts, maybes about it. You can blame things on the UNAT team for the players that we have or don't have. You can blame, you know, individual players for the way that they played or didn't play, the chances they scored or didn't score. That's why you have subs, and that's, I think we have pretty good subs. If you look at our bench, there's a lot of very quality players there that I'm sure Copenhagen's coach would love to have on their team mm -hmm. that we had at our disposal that we didn't utilize until it was kind of too late, right? You know, we, we put in a good attack at the end of the game, but did we though? Like, you know, Copenhagen, they, they scored their goal. All they needed was a tie. They had the lead. So at that point, they're like, listen, guys, I like you guys have barely done shit until now. We are 1-0 ahead. Let's see what you can do. They they went into their safe mode and let us attack. So we should not be fooled that all of a sudden, you know, we started attacking. I'm sure it gave the players a little bit of energy, a little bit of guzz. Okay, look, it's 1-0. We got to risk it. So, of course, we started attacking more than before. But, you know, the changes, they, they were pretty good just late, right? I mean, Ziyech came on for Tete at minute 61. With Mertens on for Kanaihan. So ZH is a player that we all expected at minimum halftime. Mertens we expected minimum halftime. So these both these players came 16 minutes after the start of the half. Barish, uh, Bakambu came on uh, for Zaha, six, minute 65. Barish Alperyumas came on minute 77 for Analinho. So we saw Analinho play 77 minutes in that game before he came off. He had what, John? Maybe two? 
three good crosses leading up to that in terms of mom- like play, you know, yeah. making good passes into the box or the midfield. I wasn't necessarily convinced. So 77 minutes, Okonoja, like, I'm not sure why we waited that long for that. And Oliveira for Torreira, minute 78. You know, at that point, we're getting pretty desperate to find a goal. Uh, so changes were okay. Just once again, very late. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to say uh, about uh, Angel Nino, I find it interesting. Whether it's true or not, immediately after the match, uh, Roldop made a post saying that this was his last match for Galatasaray and we have agreed with uh, two different left backs, one of which we've made a lot of progress with. And to be honest, I'm leaning towards that probably being true because it just looked like he couldn't give half a fuck today on the pitch, honestly. It looked like he just didn't care about winning this game. It looks like he was just... Like, I don't know if you've ever had to go to work knowing it's your last day. You just show up, like, just to show up because you have to. But you don't really care because once it's over, you're going home and you never have to see these people again and whatever, right? That's what, yeah. he, that's what he looked like to me today. And that is, bro, like, I don't even have words for that. That's unbelievably disappointing. Um, yeah, that was my gripe with him. Along with him, like, he was just shit all game but that's what i i I really didn't like i didn't like he just looked disinterested in a match like this though like come like i don't know that that's so upsetting to me how you can have someone on the pitch like that that looks like they just don't care and in a match like this like whether you don't realize how big this is or i guess you just don't care i don't know john i i wouldn't be surprised if that was the game plan all along, you know, mm-hmm. look, Angelino, we, I mean, it's been rumored, right? We we yeah. talked about it on the last podcast. Yeah. You know, we didn't know what was official or not, but we had a very good idea that Angelino is not staying, given his performances the the rest of the six months prior to, uh, that he has a clause that is close to being triggered, and that we're saving his perform like his uh, appearances for the Champions League, mm-hmm. and you know. We we went about it, okay, I guess that makes sense. You know, if, if he's going to play, he's going to play in the Champions League. He has the experience. We talked about it last week. We said, we suppose it makes sense. You know, I, I, I vouch for that over Barisha Parimas. But in hindsight now, you know, I, I do feel silly. It doesn't make sense. Like, Angelino, you made a great comparison to the last day of work thing, by the way. That That is very accurate. Yeah. Angelino doesn't care if... Galsai goes to the Champions League, Europa League, or gets kicked out of Europe. He has nothing to... I'm sure there's bonuses that he could have gotten. I think there was a rumor of like a certain percentage of today's win would go to the players on the pitch or whatever it is. So I'm sure he had a little bit of monetary incentive. But overall, like the dude probably knew he's not going to play for Galsai again. And when you think about it, was that is that really a good plan? Like, no matter what... Angelino, we promise you, whether it's a handshake or, you know, a written promise, you're playing this last game against Copenhagen. Is that really a guy that you want to give the trust to, Mm -hmm. knowing that he's not here for the rest of the season? And then how do the rest of the players on the pitch think about that? And I think that's another component that maybe I'm reaching here, John. I, I do want to know what you think, but if you're a player on this team, whether you're a starter, a bench player, and you are smart enough to understand the game. You you see what's going on in practice. You see the team play every weekend in person right there, whether you're on the pitch involved or on the sidelines. You see it all, just like us fans do. You see more of it, actually. Um, and then you understand, okay, this guy works, this guy doesn't work. Or in some cases, I, as a player, maybe Mertens, I think I work on the team when I play. And I don't work when I'm not on, like the team doesn't work when I'm not there. So everybody makes your observations, right? Mm -hmm. You head into this match that is so crucial to you. Again, monetary incentive bonuses, but also how the team does going forward. You know, this might be you playing Champions League for the uh, Europe round of 16 for the first time, for example, Zaha, or the rest of the guys who want to obviously continue in the Champions League, make a name for themselves, show themselves if they're a young player or not. So you, all this, right? 
Now take this into consideration and say to yourself, okay, you see this lineup. Do you think that the players are happy with the lineup that comes on the pitch? Do you the players analyze the game throughout, whether they're on the pitch or not, how it's going, what the changes are needed, and they see it's not working and the changes aren't coming to either help them or help the team? That lowers the momentum. I mean, I played football for a while, but I, I didn't play at the highest level, college or professionally. So again, like I, I don't have the 100% experience in it, but as a player, when you see these things, it, it affects you. Of course, you know, you're given the job. It's a coach's decision. All right, I'm playing. I'm not playing. That guy's playing. He's not playing. But when you want to win, you, you want the best on the pitch. You want the best changes live. And when that doesn't come, it brings you down. Like, people yeah. are complaining about the team playing badly today. Everybody playing badly today. I'm not saying that the mentality and the feelings towards the lineup and the changes is the reason why they played bad today. But I would, I would be very confident, confident to say that it's part of the reason why the guys on the pitch today looked like a shadow of their former selves because they're starting to see that the the team that's playing is not necessarily the right players that should be playing and i don't know that would that would impact me as a player on the pitch yeah i'm i mean you know i'm sure that that's you know that can be disheartening to see if you're a player um especially like when it comes to football everyone has their own opinions you know like right down to the players you know, maybe one guy thinks that Tete is the right decision. Another guy thinks that Ziyech is the right decision. You know, players also make little clicks within the team. And, you know, maybe Bowie thinks Ndombele should play. And maybe Torreira disagrees or wh- wh- whatever the case may be. But I really hope that, you know, like going forward, we've we've secured a place in, in the Europa League. And... I really hope that we're not going to see, you know, repetition of these things that should be like almost routine, common sense things. You know, we're we're losing games here for the most ridiculous reasons. And it's costed us a lot. It's costed us our place in the Champions League, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I can only hope some of these things will be corrected. Now that we have, um, we didn't mention it, but our league is on a little bit of a delay now with the uh, referee incident. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that could be a blessing in disguise for us to sort of regroup and reset here and you know, really take a look at where things went wrong and how we're going to right these wrongs in the Europa League. Because... I mean, history has a funny way of repeating itself. Everyone knows that. That's no secret. And I can't help but think that, you know, this is resembling a story I've seen before. And that being when we won the UEFA Cup, right? Finishing third in the group and things like this. Unfortunately, we thought history was going to repeat itself by claiming another victory inside of the stadium tonight. But clearly, that wasn't the case. That's not what history had wrote for us. But, you know, we have, we're going into a competition now that still has some really good teams. And um, it, it would just be such a ginormous shame if we can't make a run here. You know, the team that we have and things like this, we should be making a run in Champions League. If we can't make a, a decent run here in the Europa League, I'm not sure where to go for after that. Like, where do you go from there? You know, you, you bow out of a group you should have been qualified from already. And then you go into Europa League and come crashing out of Europa League as well. Like, where does that leave us financially? And, you know, there's so many aspects to consider, right? So that's, that's what I'm sort of wondering now after seeing this performance and how things are going, you know? Yeah. Um- it's hard to uh, sit down and think about the Europa League for me and what's what we can do there. It's probably a smart way to go about it, given that the Champions League is now out of question, and that is we need to move on, obviously. 
uh, the wounds are still fresh. We have a good team. Um, Okan Buruk has loads of experience. You know, this is not to say that Okan Buruk is gonna make mistakes every single game going forward. He has coached a very good golf side for quite some time now. So Europa League is something that we can aim for, and you know, uh, we can look at our mistakes here and say, look, let's let's amend those mistakes. Let's do well in Europe continue to go as far as we can in the Europa League. Um, it's going to affect probably the the transfers that we do or don't make in the winter now. now. There were some rumors of, oh, if we make it to the next round of Champions League, this player might come, this player might come. Of mm. course, it's all rumors, so it's hard to really say what's the truth or not. Mm. But um, Europa League is the focus, but you know we, we need to, of course, do our job in the domestic league uh we can't let this bring us down it will but we can't let it bring us down for too long because if we want to play in the champions league again and really amend ourselves next season we have to win the league because by winning the league that's how you get into the champions league again so um we just need to really learn our lessons from this um whether that's bringing in the right players for the position that we are lacking in or not putting certain players in positions that clearly don't work um yeah so that that's i guess that's one <clears> way <throat> to look at it um i'm just, just pretty hurt man <laughs> yeah I, it's of course of course it's <laughs> you, things man you mentioned the uh the fact that we're playing the same stadium that we we lifted the trophy and god yeah. man there, there was just so much damn hype with that you know players you know instagram stories hype videos on twitter and instagram like that's that's the nice thing about being a football fanatic you know you you live the game before it even begins you know yeah ever since the final whistle blew against adana demisport this is all we were thinking about and you know watching highlights for hype videos for and to see it come crashing like this is it's gonna hurt uh you mentioned the Super League being postponed. We'll talk about that in more detail with the rest of the guys on the yeah. weekend episode. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to be said there. This is more of a Copenhagen game episode, live live feedback. But uh, just a quick note on the fact that we're postponed in that game is maybe a blessing in disguise for us in a little bit. Because the guys after this game, we, we normally had a pretty quick turnaround of a game against, I think, Sivas. It would it would have been tough to play that game with the yeah. current added ment- mental that we have now, right? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, like I said, maybe this is a good chance for us to sort of, uh, you know, hit the reset button and regroup and focus our attention on our new goals now that have come from this and, you know, being the Europa League and things like that. Um, I I will mention uh, one thing about Europa League. So from my understanding, it looks like we're going to have to play a playoff match um, against one of the second place teams that qualified from their Europa League group. Um, Yeah, so I'm going to run through just briefly some notable names that you know, we can potentially come up against depending on how the last round of games goes. But um, some decent teams. So we have Sporting Lisbon from Portugal, Villarreal, Freiburg, West Ham, Brighton, Marseille, Molde, Roma, uh, Rangers. Um, Yeah, so some pretty good teams. And those are teams that are... You know, some of those teams are going to finish third. Some are going to finish second. That's why I say potential opponents. And then you you also have the teams um, that are pretty much making it out top of their group. You know, you have West Ham, Liverpool. Um, yeah, those two off the top of my head. But there's there's some top teams. Leverkusen, who's been really, really good. Um, so top teams. It's going to be fun to watch once we sort of lick our wounds here. And, uh, yeah, it sucks. It definitely sucks, but, um, good, a good chance to sort of reset here. So we'll see how our, how our team can sort of bounce back. Yeah. I mean, 
I think we can all agree that the, the squad that we have right now is capable of playing the Champions League. We saw it against United. We saw it against Bayern Munich. And that's part of why it stings so much. But uh, looking at it from a positive note, the teams that you mentioned are teams that we should and could beat. Mm-hmm. Of course, we said the same for Copenhagen. And that didn't happen. But mistakes from our own side happened, right? We we did this to ourselves. The reason why we're not in the round of 16 is because of our own mistakes and decisions. Not necessarily because we're just not good enough. So hopefully we learn from those mistakes. And if we do come crashing out of the Europa League, it's because we simply faced a much better team. Um, not because we shot ourselves in the foot once again. And... Again, the teams you mentioned, we should be able to do work against. So I look forward to it. Uh, the Europa League is not uh, a strange place for us. It's it's familiar. Uh, you know, we, we, we lifted the trophy once before, and there's no reason why we can't do it again. Um, so I do look forward to that. No more Tuesday, Wednesday night football. Now we're, I guess we're going to focus on Thursdays, right? right? The Europa right. League. So, yep. so uh <laughs> There's one change coming for us, but um, yeah, man. Uh, I it is what it is. Is is there anything else that you? I mean, there's a lot to talk about this game. Um, our our intention was to just kind of get initial thoughts out. We have other very good co-hosts that will want to share their opinions about this game, so we can leave some things that are to be talked about for a different day as well. Um, definitely be on the lookout for an episode this weekend. I know now that we don't have the Siva Sport game, what whether we do that episode or when we do it is actually a question. But uh, we'll, we'll probably make some time for it. Uh, John, what do you what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And and we actually have um on the 18th of December we actually have the draw, uh, the knockout round playoff draw for Europa League. So that's in about a week's time, a little under a week. Um, so maybe we can put something out with a preview for, for that, but, um, yeah. So with everything said, that's football, you know, there's winners, there's losers, definitely ups and downs, joy and misery. But I think the one thing that keeps this all together, our amazing supporters and our teacher, Balti Terim said it best. İyi günümüz dede, kötü günümüz dede, daima yanımızda olan muhteşem Galatasaray taraftardır. Thank you everyone for listening to episode 74 of The Lions Den. Take care.